Greetings in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ on this day in which we look at proper 14 from Matthew chapter 14, verses 22 to 33, Jesus walking on the water. Uh, this comes in the gospel immediately on the heels of the feeding of the 5,000. So you're preaching this week on two pericopes that are right next to each other in the gospel. Now, I was just saying, this is one of those passages I don't know very well, because it's not in Luke's gospel. The, it is a miracle that is um, unique to Matthew and Mark, Jesus walking on the water. And in many ways, it's one of the miracles that is the most difficult to wrap our minds around. Every miracle, of course, is a miracle and is, in many ways, hard for us as human beings to comprehend. But this one almost seems to be in a different category. It's not as, as much of a nature miracle as a healing would be, or even the, the, the feeding of the 5,000. Here, Jesus almost comes across like Superman, you know, doing something that is just like above and beyond any kind of natural, you know, laws of gravity sort of thing. And it, it is, a, I, I think in that sense, a miracle that, that puzzles people, but also gives an opportunity to explain why this miracle is there and what it is that is happening. Now, first of all, I think we have to talk a little bit about the sea. And the winds and the waves here, there's a storm. The sea has always been, and I'll just use the language of the Old Testament, the place of the Leviathan. It's a place of darkness. It's a place where, you know, Satan sort of dwells. It's a, it's, a, it's a dark, satanic place. The sea is, is oftentimes a place where you can really sense the loneliness and the lostness of our humanity, being lost at sea. Um, sea can be frightening. Uh, I grew up on the water. I have a tremendous amount of respect for the water. Um, I feel comfortable in the water, but I also know that water is something that can be a, a friend and a foe, and you have to be very serious when you are in a boat or when you're swimming. Water can be a very dangerous thing. And you can see here in the Sea of Galilee that it, it, it's known for its storms, it's known for its tumultuous character, and you have this scene now of Jesus um, walking on the water to his disciples who are in the boat. Now, it starts out with... Um, immediately, and notice this is not, not normally a, a associated with Matthew, more with Mark, but, but Jesus is the one who, who sends his disciples off into the boat, you know? You know, he makes them, you know, to go up into the boat. And where are they going? They're, they're going on ahead of him to the other side. And he is dismissing the crowds. Now this, is, of course, is coming right on the heels of the feeding of the 5,000, you know, dismissing the crowds. Jesus, they're on the boat, so you got two different scenes here. They're on the boat, you know, going to the other side, and Jesus goes up into the mountain privately. There's that privately. This is what he was trying to do before the feeding of the 5,000. He's, in a sense, communing with his Father by means of prayer. This is infinitive of purpose, in order to pray. Now, in a way, this is an echo, as I said, of, of what was the, the context, the introduction to the feeding of the 5,000. Then you have this expression, the evening, while well, it's getting evening, so this parallels the feeding of the 5,000. As I, as I said, this is the language that is used at the beginning of the law, Last Supper. And he seems to be able to accomplish his private prayer. Jesus is alone. He's alone there. So you, you, you kind of have two competing scenes, and, and it's set up very nicely by the evangelist. You've got the boat, and you've got Jesus on the mountain alone in prayer. Now, he's out, um, he, excuse me, the disciples are out, as it says, a considerable distance, literally many stadia, many stadia. So they're out there quite a ways from the, earth, from the, from the land. And, and look at the language here. They are buffeted by the waves. They're, it's an interesting word, buffeted. 
You know, that's how we oftentimes translate it, by the waves. And, and there's a great, a great wind. So we have a storm, you know, a storm on the sea. Now, we could allegorize this to death, but you really don't have to. I mean, a storm on the sea is in many ways what it is to be human in this world. There are, there are stormy days. There are stormy seas. And we have to learn how to deal with them, you know. The, the wind, you know, is oftentimes against us. Now, time references. Here, it's, it's towards evening. Here, it's the fourth watch. So he's very specific when this happens. And I put in, I put in the yellow here what, what is, is the miracle. J Jesus comes to them walking on the sea. It's amazing, you know. It's amazing, walking on the sea. You know, the disciples seeing him walk on the sea, um, they're terrified. Now, I put that in, I put the, the language of fear or the language of just sort of uncertainty um, in, in blue because it's, it's a big part of this text, you know, that they are, that they are afraid, you know, and, and that they have this, this reaction of, of being terrified. That's, that's, a, that's a very strong word, you know, they're very deeply, deeply disturbed. Now, obviously, they're disturbed for a number of reasons. There's a storm, the wind is against them, and now, you know, they think they're seeing, and this is a great word here, a phantasma, a ghost, a, fa a phantom, you know. Um, now, Jesus walking on the water, here you can see what is a remarkable principle about Jesus as the Creator. You know, he has power over the winds and the waves, but as the creator, he has power over the creation itself. And you have a glimpse here of Jesus in his resurrected presence, his glorified presence, where he is not subject to space and time as we are. That he, in a sense, suspends that here to show that he is the Lord of creation and that he has the power, and I think this is something you can preach on here, that he has the power to defeat Satan. I think you have the Christus Victor theme in the walking on the water. You have the, the creational, you know, Jesus having his power over the deep, over the Leviathan, over the powers of darkness, and that, that he shows himself to be certainly much more than simply a ghost. He is the creator in the flesh, in a sense, you know, dominating his creation by what he does. Now here's the fear. They're afraid. They're afraid. And they're, they're afraid for a lot of reasons. As I said, they're afraid of the wind and the waves. And, and they're, they're afraid of this presence, this phantasma that is coming. I, I think they, they, they are beginning to see this as a holy moment. I, I really like to try to find a way to get to the holy presence when you see the language of fear. Because that is at the heart of the, 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 the human fear in the Gospels of holiness and being unworthy, you know, or being in a position where they are in the darkness. Now, I think what the disciples are sensing here is that they are completely, totally surrounded by the darkness. They're about to be engulfed by the darkness. And so they cry out in this, this loud voice. And then Jesus, and I put it in green here, th this is his absolution to them. Here is his, his you know, his his declaration that, that, they, that they are worthy to, in a sense, stand in this presence. They are worthy to, 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 in a sense, overcome the wind and the waves and the sea and the Leviathan in that sea. You know, take heart or courage, it's sometimes translated. Ego a me. I mean, there it is. The great, you know, the great confession of Jesus, you know, Old Testament uh, presence here. He is the great I am. And that great I am 
is the great I am of the creator who has power over his creation. And then be not afraid. This is, a, this is the absolution right there. Be not afraid. Be not afraid to, to enter into this presence. And that, that's exactly what Peter wants to do. Peter, Peter is just, a, just an amazing person in that he gets it and then he doesn't get it. And, and I want you to be kind of attuned to Peter here because in a couple of weeks, we're going to hear his great confession and we're going to want to going to highlight that a little bit. Now, now Peter wants it. He wants to, he wants to enter that presence. You know, he's afraid, but, but he's, he's got the courage and, and he, he, he calls him Lord. You know, if, if you, if you are willing, you know, permit me to come to you on the water. Peter has got the faith to believe that Jesus will allow him to, to participate in this creation, in this new creation, to, to, in a sense, assume his own resurrected, glorified presence at this moment. And Jesus says to him, come. He says, come. He, he welcomes him. It's like a transfiguration almost. That's coming up in a couple chapters, but this is almost an anticipation of that. <clears throat> and Peter's not afraid. At, you know, he, he comes up out of the boat, and he walks on the water. There it is again. I put it in yellow so you can see that it, it's parallel to, the, to the, other, the other walking on the water. I mean, it's not just Jesus who walks on water, <coughs> but it's Peter too. You see the two walking on the water. You know, here it's water and there it's, it's on the sea, but it's obviously the same thing. What you see here, though, is this remarkable moment in which Peter has faith. He believes. And th here you have that bold Peter coming right forward. But he, you know, it's like the world comes in, the nature comes in. I mean, and he sees the strong wind. And here's the second reference to afraid. He's afraid. He's afraid. <coughs> and here he's really afraid of nature, but I think he's afraid of this theophanic moment. And he begins to sink, and he cries out, just like the disciples do. And notice he uses the same expression, Lord. And here's the expression of salvation. Save me. Save me from sinking down into the darkness. And Jesus, of course, does save him. And I love the tactile nature of this. Taking him by the hand, takes hold of him, and he says to him, and I put it in, in I usually use this color kind of as repentance or sin, a little faith, you know, and it, it's, it's, it's one of the great, I mean, you see this in a number of places, the great kind of chastisements of Jesus. You of little faith, why are you doubting? You know, and here you can see that Peter goes from faith to doubt. And I mean, that, that, is, that is the nature of our humanity. We move from faith to doubt. And you don't really have it, you know, um, resolved in a sense. You know, at least Peter doesn't, there's no kind of like Peter coming around, but but what happens? The wind dies down. And what, what I love about this particular passage here is Peter and, and Jesus climb into the boat. So Jesus is in the boat now. And it's just like in the, 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 the calming of the wind and the waves. The minute that Jesus is in the boat, the boat in many ways is like the church where Jesus is present in the boat. Then creation comes under control, okay? The winds, what happens to them? They die down. They quiet. And you can see here that, that the presence of Jesus, this incredible theophany of Jesus, of him walking on the water, this phantasm, he's now in the boat, he brings peace, he brings quiet. And it, you can see that, that the boat is, is, is like the church. It's a liturgical space. I mean, 
what do they do? They, they prostrate themselves in worship. I mean, it's a place of worship on the boat. I mean, we're not making this up that the boat is like the, you know, the seminary chapel is built like the ark. It's like a boat. The boat is, is the church. And then they make the great confession, you know, and it's amazing. I mean, we always say Peter makes the great confession. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. But here they are saying, truly, you are the son of God. And they recognize Jesus for who he is. And what they recognize him as is the creator who has the power over creation. The creation that he brought into the being by the power of his word. Now, you don't see him speaking and, and calming the storm. But in a way, he does up here. I won't go back to it up here, but where he gives them the absolution, be not afraid. And then he says to Peter, come. There he is speaking into the creation as the creator. So this is a wonderful opportunity to see how it is that we can truly understand the fullness of Jesus as the one who comes into this creation to, in a sense, make all things new. The new creation is one of the most important themes in the, in the Gospels. And you know that that new creation comes at the cross. That's, that's where he makes all things new. I mean, I, I always highlight that Mel Gibson movie where he falls down in that square and he says to his mother something that is from Revelation, Mother, I'm making all things new. That's what happens in the cross. And all of these miracles are in anticipation of how he has the power even over Satan, even over the deep, even over the Leviathan, that he can walk on the water because he is the one who created the earth and the stars and the sea. And so we have these two wonderful miracles here in the middle of the summer to reflect on. The miracle of the great feeding of the 5,000 and now this miracle of that extraordinary moment where Jesus walks on the water.